Day 153 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Happy Sunday, friends. If you're studying with us in real time, a big thank you to Holly for covering our Saturday lesson. We are in a new book today, Song of Solomon. And if you looked at this, you may have once again, just like Psalm 119 said, oh boy, this is a daunting task that is upon us. Now, I will say that today's lesson requires a little bit more of a mature mind, some maturity. We are going to be talking about marriage and intimacy within it. And so if you have little ears with you, or if you are on the younger side, I would just proceed with caution, you know, maybe save this one for a later date. Or if you feel that you are mature enough to be able to listen to this lesson and to learn from it, because I believe there are wonderful lessons you can learn in it, then by all means. But I just wanted to make sure to let you know first what we're going to be talking about. We are reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But before we begin, if you could please hit the roll call button. Hit the thumbs up button if you are a BSF, if you're part of the Heart Die family, and that is your way of giving back to a free ministry. We appreciate that because this helps the channel to grow, which means it will help more people come to God's Word and just have that desire to want to learn about Him, to spend time with Him. That's that's what we are doing here. That is why we are pouring out our hearts and our time and our energy is to get people to fall in love with the Word of God and to just get excited about it. Subscribing to the channel is helpful. And if you want to know when the videos come out, make sure you got that notification bell on. And lots of information in the description box or the show notes. So if you are new here, please make sure to check that out. We also have a website, heartdive.org with lots of information. And speaking of which, Holly just built a brand new page because you know she's been giving out those little freebies here and there. Well, well, she now has a page on our website that you can access because we know everybody is not studying at the same rate. So those little social media graphics that we've been providing where you are able to check off the boxes of the different books you've read, you can access them all there. I'll put the link in the description box or you can just go to our website and check that out. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and pray and jump into it because we got lots of ground to cover today. So Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We honor you, give you all of the praise, honor and glory for you are worthy of it, Lord. We thank you for this time that we get to come here to open up your word. And I just pray, Lord, that it will be the daily manna that we need. We thank you that your mercies are new this morning and that we are able to come here with a fresh perspective, with open eyes, open ears, and an open heart to be able to receive whatever it is that you are going to speak to us today. Will you do a work within us, Holy Spirit? We know that we are always open to change and that we need it because we are being perfected from glory to glory every single day. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord. Wash us clean today by your blood. We thank you for that beautiful free gift of grace that you've given to us. And what you did on the cross is something of magnitude that we could never pay back. Help us also to forgive others, Lord, and to release others the same way that you've released us from that bondage of sin. Please don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Song of Solomon, this is a love story. We are basically reading in eight chapters an entire movie, an entire storyline of a relationship between a man and a woman who love each other so much. You're going to see the passion. You're going to see the conflict. You're going to see the resolve. I mean, it's pretty incredible. If you've read this before and just kind of saw it as some love poem and you couldn't wrap your mind around it, I'm hoping that by the end of today's lesson, you will be able to see the bigger picture we're going to do our best to get you there. So written by Solomon himself, this celebrates the beauty and the intimacy within the context of marriage. So let's get that on our minds first. This love story is a picture of the way that God intended for intimacy to be a gift within the confines of marriage. So not before marriage, not outside of marriage, this is within it. So the purpose of it is to affirm the sanctity within marriage, and it is a picture also of God's love for His people. Now, this is debated because there have been scholars in the past who said that this was completely allegorical, meaning that this was just a poetic version of God's love for His people, but you will notice that God is only mentioned once in this book, and so we just have to take it for what it is. This is a story about love and intimacy. However, you can still see the love of God 
through this picture. So keep that in mind as well as we move through this. And I will try my best to be able to separate the two. So we're going to start off here in chapter one, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So this is otherwise known as the loveliest of songs, kind of like the way he would say the King of Kings or the Lord of Lords. It's like the ultimate song of all others. And you will note here in my Bible, in the ESV version, they note who is speaking. This is also up for debate. Um, there is one portion where I think there is an error in that. This this was never written with those notes, just to let you know that. It was just one continuous poem, and it has baffled the minds of scholars for a long time as to who is saying what. But I think for the most part, ESV has gotten it correct, and I'll show you where I believe that there might be an error. Verse 2, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. So we start off here with her longing for the presence of her love. This is pre-marriage now, so they're in the dating phase. And you know how it is in the beginning of love. You just want to forsake everything. You don't want to spend time with anybody else but this person. You don't want to do anything else but hang out with them. And this love here that she is talking about in verse two, this love is eros. This is the intimate love. That's where we get the word erotica, erotic love. So passionate love. This is that intimate love. So she's saying that is better than wine. Even though she hasn't experienced it yet because they're not married, she knows the feelings that she gets when she's with him. She is passionately infatuated with him. And when she compares it to wine, wine, we know it is intoxicating, which love can be, or even lust. It is healing as well. It is symbolic of joy and feasting, and it's exhilarating. Now, when we look at it in the spiritual sense, there is nothing that compares to the love of God and the love of Christ. That is where we are going to find that true satisfaction, that true joy. And when she says, your name is oil poured out, of course, this speaking of his character and his reputation, and that is why all of the other women have feelings for him. So she's the lucky one who has this tall, dark, and handsome man, and everybody is so like, oh! we wish that we could have a guy like that. And so he's not only beautiful on the outside, but on the inside as well. He's got good character. But I think this is really cute too. These daughters of Jerusalem, these are like her bridesmaids who are gathering around and like, tell us all the details. We want to know. And when she says, draw me after you, Jesus does this. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you and let us run after him. So this whole first section here brought back all the feels of that young love. If you've ever experienced it, you know, when everything was exciting and all you could talk about was how wonderful this person was, and all you could think about was being with them. And what a lot of us experience is that once that honeymoon phase is over, and then real life sets in, you know, the socks are missing the hamper, or they start stealing the covers, they don't put things back the way you like it, that excitement kind of starts to go away. And then you begin to see things that you once loved about that person as annoying. And then you have your first fight, and you hit a crossroad of whether or not you are going to fight to stay in that relationship or you're going to flee. So I thank God that the many times that we got to this point in my own marriage, we both fought to stay because it really came full circle. You know, every time we got over a hurdle, a new excitement came with it because there is power in the way that you fight against or you fight for your marriage. And one of the biggest lessons that I had to learn in my 16 years of being married, I know it's not a lot. I know many of you have been married a lot longer, but the power of my words, the words that I speak about my husband, because what I realized is that when I would talk smack about him, not only was I dishonoring him, but I was dishonoring God as well in the fact that he chose my husband. It's as if I was saying, Lord, your choice was not good enough for me. But the greater effect that it had was the way that it would tear my husband down in my own mind, but also in the mind of others. So I had to choose to honor him with my words and choose to speak highly of him rather than complain about him. And what it did is it changed the way I saw him. So heart check, if you're married, how do you speak about your spouse, both to yourself and to others? 
And then this portion of the king has brought me into his chambers. This is a picture of the bride being brought into the palace and illustrating the way that she would first have to acknowledge him as king before they would become intimate with each other. It was almost like this acknowledgement of submission. And whenever we talk about an intimate relationship with the Lord, some people aren't able to get to that place and they'll never know of it because they can never bring themselves into the palace. It's almost as if they are unwilling to fully commit and fully submit their lives to the Lord, and therefore they never experience that deep connection with Him. So in a sense, they only stay in the dating phase where they can just come and go as they please, and they don't have to answer to anyone. So heart check. Do you have true intimacy with the Lord? Have you come into the palace? Are you fully committed and submitted to Him? And so here enters the others, which otherwise known as the daughters of Jerusalem, her bridesmaids, her friends. And they say, we will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. So they are rejoicing in this sweet young love. Verse five, she continues, I'm very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. So the reason why she is feeling a little bit unworthy or insignificant at this point is because of the fact that her skin is a little bit darker, because she is a woman who works in the fields. And it was known that those who worked in the city were a little bit more pale, I guess, because they weren't doing the hard work in the fields. So they were higher class. They weren't the working class. And so she's feeling a little bit self-conscious conscious about this. She says, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me and they made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So it's almost like she was Cinderella, you know, with her brothers making her do all the dirty work. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon, for why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So she's longing for him and she's like, where are you? I want to be able to find you. And when she says her soul loves him, she loves him with her deepest being. This isn't just a feeling of emotion. This is love that has been built up. It wasn't just fallen into. And then here when she says, why should I be like the one who veils herself? She's expressing that she doesn't want to appear as a prostitute who is chasing after him. In other words, she cares about her integrity and her reputation. And the world gives us the advice to just do you boo and don't worry about what anybody else thinks. But as Christians, to a certain extent, we have to care care what people think, because our lives are a direct reflection on Christ. And while His character doesn't hinge upon our character, our character will most certainly taint the perception of God in other people's eyes if we're living loosely. So it's kind of this fine line, because at the same time, we don't want to live seeking the approval of people, nor do we want to live a double life so that we don't mess it up. But I do believe that this perception of others can be an account accountability partner for us. So heart check. Do you care about your reputation? Are you concerned about what others see of God's character within you? And then spiritually speaking, we are all tainted. We are all dark, right? We all look at ourselves and like, ugh, what's all this icky stuff on me? All of this darkness and sin. But the Lord looks upon us with so much grace. He looks at us as beautiful, without spot, without wrinkle, and He loves us even in our darkest hour. So now here comes Solomon, verse 8, If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. So he's like, honey, I've just been working. I'm out in the fields. Come find me. If you want to find me, you'll find me among the flocks. And that's the heart of a shepherd. If you want to find Jesus, Jesus, you got to go among the flocks. In other words, you got to be in fellowship because again, even though you can have a relationship without ever going to church with Jesus, there is something powerful that happens when you are among other believers, when you are linked with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And when he tells her to pasture her young goats, in other words, he's saying, feed them. The same way that Jesus said, if you want to find me, you're going to have to feed the flocks. And so it is in service also where we will grow our relationship with Christ. Because what happens whenever you start to selflessly serve others. There is a change that happens in your own heart as you lay down your life and you start to become more like Christ because He was the greatest servant of all. 
Verse 9, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. So when he calls her my love, this literally translates to dear companion. So not only is he physically attracted to her, but she's also a companion, a helpmate, a friend to him. And to say that she was like a mare, I mean, this was a big deal because at this time, the companions of kings were their horses. They were prized possessions. And so he is saying, you are a prized possession. So she she sees herself as this old, rusty, dirty work truck, whereas he sees her as like a brand new F450 Super Duty Limited Edition. Verse 10, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. So he's explaining her unique beauty, affirming her value, and he is saying, I'm going to treat you well, girl. Verse 11, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. So these are the others proclaiming this. And of course, gold is symbolic of royalty or a monarch monarchy and silver is the symbol of redemption. So with Jesus, he makes us a royal priesthood and he redeems us. Verse 12, while the king was on his couch, and your translation might read table, my nard gave forth its fragrance. So even though she's a little bit self-conscious, she is also very aware of the fact that she has the ability to attract him. She puts off a scent that makes him wild, but she doesn't use it irresponsibly. She uses it in the best way. She's still very modest about it. She's not just bearing it all and allowing everybody else to get tempted along the way. No, she is protecting that for him. And I think this is a good moment to let the young ones know, you know, this has been something that has been so tainted in our society today. I mean, it is so normal now to just see almost the entire body of people being flaunted all over the place. And again, the world will say, do you, boo, who cares what everybody else thinks? But the thing is, is again, we have to care what people think, because if we become a stumbling block for everybody else, for eyes that are looking at us, and it is our own fault, like if we are exposing certain parts of ourselves, and making people weak, we're going to be held accountable for that. So there is a responsibility that we have to maintain a modesty so that it doesn't weaken the walk of others. Now, I'm not judging anybody, but I will pose the question, what is the purpose? You know, what would the purpose be to flaunt your body to the world and not keep that as a sacred gift for your spouse? And I say this with all of the love and all of the tender hearted care because I've been there. You know, I've been in that place where I didn't think it was a big deal and I didn't even have the intent, or at least I didn't think I had the intent of trying to attract eyes and minds and thoughts. But looking back on it now, I'm able to see that, oh, okay, I realized that I was doing that. So I think it would be irresponsible of me if I didn't mention this. So now coming back to the spiritual sense of it, when we now feast at his table, we are able to find that rest and that comfort with him. Verse 13, my beloved is to me as a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me like a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Okay, so let's break this down. Typically, women would wear these sachets of myrrh as a, like a necklace. So it would lie between their breasts. They would wear this at night. And then in the morning, they would radiate this scent of myrrh. It was a beautiful scent. The cluster of henna symbolizes beauty, life, fragrance, and good health, and this attractiveness. So she's picturing him as lying on her chest, having him close to her, which gives her this rush. You know, when she talks about the vineyards of Engedi, this was a famous oasis in the Judean wilderness where it was surrounded by barrenness, but it was just this one spot that was like lush and really fruitful. But spiritually speaking, myrrh was actually a burial spice. So if we look at the fact that when Jesus was born and they brought gifts of myrrh, it was almost as if they were saying, you have been born so that you can die. We know that that is the very case. That was the purpose of Jesus. And so the one who is able to hold him close to their hearts, like that sachet of murder, hold that death close to their hearts and understand it, know what it means and apply it to their lives, is going to be the one who has done all of these things, forsaken all others, longs for their presence, submits to him, commits their life to him, sees their darkness, receives that gift of grace, lives with integrity, is in fellowship, serves other people. And so that is where that closeness and that intimate relationship comes from. Verse 15, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes 
are doves. And so again, we see this love as dear friend and a dove symbolizing purity, innocence, and beauty. And that is what he sees in her eyes, which are windows to the soul is what we often say. And when the Lord looks into the windows of our soul, you know what he sees? He sees the Holy Spirit. He sees that dove. He sees Jesus within us. And therefore, he sees that purity and that innocence and that beauty. Verse 16, behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. So she's reciprocating this same kind of speech, truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters are pine. So this is almost that picture of a couple who is just thinking about their future. They're looking at the house. They're dreaming about where they're going to live. And she is excited about it. She's like, look how lucky we are. And when we take on that kind of heart, that heart of gratitude, to say, man, look how blessed we are. That is when we are going to find that contentment and that peace and that rest in Jesus. Chapter two, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily in the valleys. Now, this is a highly debated verse right here. Some scholars have said in the past that these were poetic titles of Jesus. Even Charles Spurgeon said that this was Jesus advertising his grace, his beauty, so that it would then attract people to want to come to him. But other scholars are like, nope, that's the complete wrong approach because Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't need to advertise himself, but just looking at it at face value, it's almost as if the bride now is feeling a little more confident, you know, that love has now poured out all of these words of affirmation. And she's like, I am a rose. But you know what? The rose and the lily, these weren't the most beautiful of flowers. They were more common and considered wildflowers. So even though she feels confident and beautiful, she doesn't feel like she is above anybody else. So this is expressing a bit of humility here. As a lily among the brambles, so is my love among the young women. So he's like, no, you're not just a rose or a lily. You are a lily among brambles. So he's literally saying you are the beautiful flower and everybody else is a thorn. So he's removing any doubt and he is letting her know that she has extraordinary beauty. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat in his shadow and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. So his love for her is public. He is not ashamed to show that this is my lady and I love her. Now, this word love here is related to agape love. It's more of a common love. So this is not the eros love we're talking about anymore. So it seems as though their love is growing. And when she says she takes great delight in his shadow, this is showing the security, that peace that she feels, that protection that she feels when she is near him. Verse five, sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. Now, raisins and apples were ancient symbols of sensual passion. So she is feeling very lovesick here. And she's like, I need you to satisfy me because I can't eat. You know that feeling when you first love a person, you're just like, oh my gosh, I cannot eat. So they still got some heavy attraction going on. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. So now she's kind of entering into this daydream, picturing him, imagining him. caressing her, passionately loving her. So she says in verse seven, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the fields, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now, this love here is erotic love, Eros. And so this has been debated whether or not this is her telling her friends, you guys guard your purity. You know, we we know that there's this passion before marriage, but don't stir it up. Don't awaken it until you are married. Others have said, no, this is talking about don't stop until you're satisfied. I'm gonna leave that to you to interpret as we continue in verse eight. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes. So she hears him coming. So it's like she's invigorated again. She's like, wait, he's here? Leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter's past and the rain is over and gone. So he's like, it's time to rejoice. You know, there's some excitement going on here. We're in springtime. We got a new season to go through. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. 
So this is him getting off of work. He's excited to go out on a date with her and he's like, let's go, get up. Now, of course, we can see this picture of Jesus. There's nothing too big for him. He can leap over mountains as well to be able to come to us. And the fig tree here in verse 13, if you know, the fig tree is often seen as a symbol for the nation of Israel. And so when it says the fig tree ripens its figs, well, Jesus said that this would be a sign of the times when the budding of the fig tree happens. This was a sign that he was coming back. And so... Some scholars believe that the fig tree blossomed in 1948 when Israel became a nation once again. And so now we're kind of just in that time of overtime waiting for Jesus to come back. So when he says, arise, my love, you can just hear Jesus like, arise, church, let's go. This is that final hour before I come to take my bride. Verse 14, oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know if she is hiding from him, if she's ashamed. And I know that kind of happens in the beginning of young love. You know, you love them so much, but you're also very like, ah. And when he calls her my dove, that is so cute. It's like a little pet name for her. And then he continues in verse 15, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards for our vineyards are in blossom. All right. So what are these foxes? Well, if you know foxes, they're very cute, but they're also very destructive. So they would go into the vineyards and they would start to eat at the roots of whatever was there. And eventually the whole vineyard would be spoiled. And so he's like, we got to catch these foxes before we ever enter into our marriage. So what are potential foxes? They could be uncontrolled desires, unchecked sin, mistrust, jealousy, selfishness, pride, other people, lust. And foxes are not just pre-marriage. I mean, they continue well into the marriage and we always have to protect our vineyard against the foxes. But I remember my pastor once saying that before anybody ever gets married, they should have at least one fight, one big fight, because that is going to be a telltale sign of how they are going to be able to handle conflict within their marriage. So you may as well get it out of the way in the beginning, figure out how to fix things and how to deal with these things before you get into marriage and now you're stuck and you don't know how to deal with it or you decide to flee because you don't want to deal with it. So this would all be a part of catching the foxes together. 16, my beloved is mine and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on cleft mountains. So when she says, my beloved is mine and I am his, this is speaking of that mutual intimacy and the fact that they will eventually join together as one. But until then, she feels this strong passion and she knows that she's got to get it under control. So she She's like, I need you to flee like a gazelle right now before things go a little too far. This is very wise in the sense that she is saying we need to flee from our youthful lusts. But of course, looking at this and the way that we see Jesus, we are his. We are his treasured possession. We are his children. We are his gift. And he is ours. And we could name a whole bunch of things that he is to us. So now we enter into this daydream of hers in chapter three. On my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and I would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So in this dream, once again, she is longing for him. She's probably regretting the fact that she made him flee. And so when she goes out into the city in this dream and she goes to find him, she grabs a hold of him. She's never going to let him go. She is picturing herself bringing him to her mother's house to be able to get that approval from her family, which is something that would happen prior to a marriage before the wedding night. And once again, she repeats that phrase that do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. One of them said that this was actually Solomon saying, hey, you know what, guys, let her go ahead and rest. Don't awaken her. Others saying, take it slow, guard your purity. It's going to be worth the wait. But spiritually speaking, there are times in our lives where we feel as though Jesus is far from us and we long for him and we don't know where he's at. And so we will have to go running after him. We will have to go seeking him. But that's what Jesus says. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Don't stop and refuse to let go 
know once you do find him. And recognize the place that you find him in, because it's there where you'll be able to return once again if you ever do find yourself going off of the path. And so now here in verse 6, this is where ESV says that this is Solomon speaking of his own arrival for the wedding, but I I think this is more of the bride, and one of the reasons that I see is because this word that in the Hebrew is female, and it is singular, so what is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke? So if there is this image of something coming toward you as an image of smoke and it is feminine, then that gives us the idea that this is the bride coming to the groom. Again, another reason why I think this may be the bride with all the fragrant powders of a merchant. Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror by night. So these would be the men who go and get the bride to bring her to Solomon, because that is what would happen. The king's men would go and get the bride and bring her. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. So this is a picture of this couch that he created where the men are carrying the bride on top of this couch. So if you are going to go with the idea that this is Solomon, this would be him sitting on this couch, the men carrying him. It doesn't really matter who it is. This is just the picture I'm seeing in my brain. Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. So, of course, his crown being a symbol of honor and joy. Some scholars have said this wasn't his actual weighty crown of royalty. This was either a different crown of jewels or a different crown made out of some other sort of materials in nature. So, now the wedding has taken place. That was the wedding. We didn't get to see the I do's, but just imagine that they happened. And now in chapter four, we've got the first wedding night. Things are about to get steamy. All right. If you ever thought the Bible was boring, you, you obviously didn't read the book of Song of Solomon. Verse one, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. So this is that picture of her wearing that veil where he can only see her eyes. And this symbolic of her purity, her innocence and her beauty once again. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Now, if somebody told me that I have goat hair, which I'm pretty sure my daughter tells me every day, mommy, your hair is dead. It looks like a horse's tail, which it does, but that's fine. I do need a haircut. But he is saying your hair is long and it is flowing. It is gorgeous. He's building up her confidence here. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. He's basically saying her smile is beautiful. It's clean and white. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. So interestingly enough, back then, thin lips were actually in. So nobody was injecting their lips in this time and he loved it. It's lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranates behind your veil. So this pomegranate, speaking of the sweetness of her cheeks, probably very blushed and flush at this time. She's got a natural bronzer. She doesn't have to put highlighter on there. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone. Now, the Tower of David was built up on the hilltop, and typically there were shields that were hung from the tower, and this would symbolize that there was peace in the land, because if the shields were gone, that means that the men were out at war. So he's describing her as that peaceful tower. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. So they're still perky and young, okay? Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. So this is a picture of them being secluded and they are surrounded by all of these beautiful scents, these sweet fragrances of love. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amena, from the peak of Sinar and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Now, if you thought this was a little weird that he calls her his sister, well, this is really just calling her his family now. Like now that they are consecrating their marriage, they have become one. So this is actually speaking of like, 
like a permanence in their relationship. How beautiful is your love, my sister? Now, this is Eros' love, so he's digging this time together. My bride, how much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice? Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And there was one commentary, which I had to laugh my way through a lot of the commentary because I'm like, man, the things that these scholars wrote, I was like, okay. But there was one who was saying French kissing was around before the French. I don't know if that's what they're talking about, but I was like, okay, I can see it. Verse 12, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. So this is speaking of her virginity. And now he gets this beautiful gift of purity. This was a big deal back in the day. It should still be a big deal today, but unfortunately that has been tainted. But this garden is speaking of this privacy, you know, like everybody who had a garden, it would be within the confines of their own property. Uh, there was no random planting, you know, you had a plan for it. So it was reserved for a specific home and a specific purpose. And it was life giving, it was sacred, and it was secure. That is what virginity should be like. And it's very refreshing and delightful for the couple who comes together on their wedding night. Verse 13, your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all the choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. So things just got real spicy right there, okay? We're gonna go back now and look at this in the spiritual sense and what all of these beautiful things of the body represent. So verse one, dove's eyes. This again would be a picture of the Holy Spirit. So if we have the eyes of a dove, if that is the way that our bridegroom looks at us, then we have got Holy Spirit eyes, the ability to see. This is discernment. Long hair speaks of consecration and submission. Teeth speak of the ability to bite into the word, to assimilate truth. You know, when it says, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Lips speak of our speech. And so when Isaiah said, my lips are unclean, well, when we see ourselves as sinners, we are then washed by the blood. So this is that consecration or that cleansing that happens. Temples or cheeks, I believe is what it was in my translation. Yeah, cheeks. But other translations say temples. Um, this speaks of fruitful thoughts. So whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, all of those things from Philippians 4, 8. From verse 7, when he says there is no flaw in you, again, that is the way that Jesus looks at us without spot or wrinkle. That's the way he sees the church. That's the way he presents the church before his father. And when he says, how beautiful is your love, that is how his love is for us. And that's how he sees our love for him. It's a beautiful thing. He treasures it. He wants it. Then this picture of the garden. A garden was typically a place that Jesus would meet his people and walk with them. These Christophanies that would happen in the Old Testament. And so if we think about the fact that we have been created for the pleasure of God, we are like that garden where he wants to be able to come and to walk with us and enjoy life together. And because this garden is a fruitful and life-giving source and the well of the living water, well, Jesus says that if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink and then out of him will flow rivers of living water, which of course is speaking of the Holy Spirit. And one of the more confusing things for newer Christians is the Holy Spirit and kind of knowing his place in your life. So he is the spirit of the living God who was given to us on the day of Pentecost so that we would have the presence of God dwelling within us always. And some might ask, well, how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you? Now, one of the strongest pieces of evidence is simply fruitfulness. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if your garden is producing these kinds of fruit, it is evident that the living water is flowing through you. So heart check, how fruitful is your garden? Are you producing fruit or is it dried up? Now, sidebar, if you feel that there is a barrenness, all you got to do is ask. You know, Jesus told us just 
ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Father, who is the giver of all gifts, will love to give it to you. So we just got to turn the water hose on. That's all we got to do. Water your garden. Verse 16, awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden and let its spices flow. So there is no longer this talk of her garden. It is now his garden. So they have now become one. What was once cold got hot and spicy. Okay, so when we're looking at this spiritually, the north wind, wind that comes from the north is typically cold wind. And so you could look at this as those cold seasons where you don't feel the presence of the spirit there. And this is why we can't rely on feelings or goosebumps to be able to determine whether or not you've got the Holy Spirit around you. Those seasons sometimes happen so that we will continue to be dependent upon Him and to seek after Him. Because otherwise, we're just going to become complacent or apathetic. Now, when we talk about the south wind, this being a hot wind that comes up from the south, this could be looked at as those fiery trials that come into your life. But sometimes it's in those seasons of our lives where people see Jesus in you the most. They don't see Jesus in you when everything is hunky-dory and you're prosperous. No, they're going to see Him in you when you are going through a tough time and you are able to still maintain your joy and your dependence and your trust and your faith. And with the winds blowing over the garden, there is this scent that comes with it. And it really depends on what your garden is producing. So if there is the spirit within you, you are going to have this sweet scent that radiates from you. But if you've got bitterness, rage, negativity, any kind of criticism coming out of you, it's probably going to be an unpleasant scent and people aren't going to want to hang around. So heart check. What kind of scent are you diffusing? Is it attractive or repulsive? We continue in verse 16 where she says, let my beloved come to his garden. So she's like, it sure is his garden and eat of its choicest fruits. So again, we exist to please God. One of the easiest things that we can do every single day is just say, Lord, I am yours. How can I please you today? Chapter five. Now Solomon says, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. So he is happy. He is satisfied day after. And the others chime in, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. So they've just finished their honeymoon. Everything is hunky-dory. But now that the honeymoon is over, we're going to enter into the conflict of life. You know, when real life begins to set in. Verse 2, I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with drops of the night. So it's almost like he's knocking on her door, like he's just come home from work and she's tired and he's like, honey. And she's like, uh uh-uh. uh. I mean, that's what I'm picturing anyway. Verse three, I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? So she's like, I just took a shower. I don't want to get dirty. My beloved put his hand to the latch and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. So Now that she is opening up that door, he ain't there. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. So now we have this picture of her once again, dreaming about going after her husband now into the city, trying to find him. She's desperate. So it's almost like that role reversal in conflict, right? You got that transfer of power. Now she wants him. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil. Those watchmen of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you will tell him I am sick with love. So in her dream, she has gotten no sympathy from anybody out there as she goes running after him in their fights. And this is what will happen with the enemy. You know, whenever we either fight with our spouse or we even fight against the Lord, so we're now resisting him and what he wants, the enemy loves to come in and begin to abuse. He will begin to speak lies. He's going to do everything he can to destroy you 
so that when you come back together with your spouse or even with Jesus, you're going to have all kinds of corrupt thoughts in your mind. Verse 9, what is your beloved more than another beloved? O most beautiful among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you and thus adjure us? And so she continues in verse 10, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000s. So she's now describing him. She's talking good about him. She misses him. So when she says that he's radiant and ruddy, this speaks about his purity, his loveliness. So she's saying he is handsome, he's vibrant, he's pure, and he's also got a good reputation. He's distinguished. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. So this speaks about his quality, his prestige, his strength and vigor. Verse 12, his eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. So this, I think, is contrasting the iris of the eye and the white of the eye. So she's just describing his beauty in his eyes. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet smelling herbs. So he smells real good. And this, I think, describes his beard. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. So this is speaking of his kingly glory and his strength. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. So he's got muscles and he's got some stability going on. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So she's regretting fighting with him, just coming back to remembering why she fell in love with him, why she's missing him. And this is important for us, you know, again, to come back to that place of where you found them in the beginning. Most of us didn't come into our marriage with regret already. You know, we came into it all like goo goo gaga, excited about our person. And somewhere along the line, those things that we once saw in them, we don't see anymore, you know? So this is what is happening here. We got to come back to that place where we first found them. And up to this point, this book has been pretty steamy. But here we see that this couple's relationship went well beyond the bedroom because she calls him her friend. And one of the biggest reasons that you will see relationships fail, particularly marriages, is because the relationship was built only on physical attraction and feelings. And then once that fades, what do you have left. And this can also happen with our relationship with Christ, because if we base it on feelings and then you hit a dry season, you're going to end up discouraged. But it's the ones who keep coming back to cultivate that friendship, who have relationships that will continue to grow. And then the rest will end up discouraged and they'll eventually fall away. So then how do you cultivate that friendship? Well, you got to spend the time, you know, more than just five minutes a day. Because yeah, you might like the person, but you got to truly get to know them. You got to spend the time. So heart check. What kind of relationship do you have with Jesus? Do you spend the time getting to know him? Or do you see the time spent as an inconvenience? Chapter six. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Now, I don't know if they're being antagonistic here or if they're being supportive, but either way, they're like, let us help you find him. Verse two, my beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. So she realizes, ah, he just went back to work. And so now she's feeling a little bit more confident. She's got a booster in there, regardless of the fact that they are separated. And he says, you're beautiful as Terza, my love, lovely as Jerusalem. So now we see them back together again. I love the fact that he meets her with praise. You know, he doesn't come back and be like, where were you? What were you doing? Awesome as an army with banners. Now for a king, an army coming at him with banners is a wonderful sight. Verse five, turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ooze that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not one among them has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. Now, I don't know when Solomon wrote this. I don't know if this was about his first love. I always kind of thought it was because I'm like 700 wives and 300 concubines. I can't imagine that somewhere in between there is where he had this kind of love for a woman. 
But then here we kind of see that maybe it was in the middle of it somewhere. I don't know. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. So either she is the only one at this point, or this is his favorite wife. But again, he's giving her confidence. The young women saw her and called her blessed, the queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Now we can look at this as a picture of the church because of course there are plenty of people in the kingdom of God and in the church, but of course Jesus only sees it as one. We are just one church that he looks upon with beauty. Verse 10, who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? And so here, this is that picture of him looking with beauty upon his bride. But when we do get this picture of the way that God looks at his church or his people, this is the church in her glory. You know, people come to church because it is a light that shines out of the dark world, or at least that's what we're supposed to be. So the things that light up the church or us is the way that she looks down like the dawn. So in other words, we are able to wake up each morning to new mercies with a new perspective. And no matter what comes our way, we are able to face it head on, knowing that God is our strength, that we are more than a conqueror, that we will not fail. But if we wake up and to look to everything else in the world to give us that strength and that confidence, our light will begin to dim. So hard check. What lights up your morning? Do you see each day as a new opportunity to shine the light of Christ? And then the second thing that illuminates the church is the light of the world. It is Jesus who shines his light upon us, and then we reflect his glory. So we're kind of like the moon that is charged to bring forth light in the dark places. But if we allow the world to get between us and the sun, we're going to be eclipsed instead of allowing us to be that full moon that God intended. So heart check. What moon phase are you in? Are you a full moon, waxing gibbous, crescent? How much light are you projecting? And then while we project light into the world, we also project an even brighter light in the eyes of the Father because we are like the sun. He literally sees Jesus in us. So we are being refined and purified every single day that we are on this earth and breathing. But the greatest light that we can shine is unity you know, the unity of the army. And that is why the enemy fights so hard to divide the church, to get us to fight among and against one another. His whole mission is to divide and conquer. And if the church is fighting against itself, then who is left to defend those who are out in the world and vulnerable to his attacks? And remember in chapter two, verse four, when she said, his banner over me is one of love. So that's our mission. We are to be a united front with a banner of love over us because that's where the real power comes from. And as we draw nearer to the end, the enemy is going to continue to skew the view of the church as a militant enemy of hate. And it's already happening, which is why we have to fight even harder to love people. So heart check. How much love are you projecting? Are you standing in unity with the church or looking to divide and conquer? Verse 11, I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley. So she's going down to her homeland, to the garden of nuts. And I was like, that's a really good name for a church. You know, we got all these beautiful names like New Hope and Inspire and Hope Chapel. I'm like, can you imagine having a church called Garden of Nuts? I feel like that's more fitting, but don't want to offend anybody. To see whether the vines of, whether the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kids kinsman, a prince. So it's as if it is springtime once again, and she is reunited with her love. Verse 13, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. So here the bridesmaids are kind of like, snap out of it, sister. You're the queen and you have got other matters to tend to. And sometimes we need this kind of jolting because we can sort of get into this space of being on the mount and not ever wanting to leave it. You know, kind of like that time whenever the three guys were on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter was like, let's just build tents. It is good for us to be here, Lord. We don't want to go anywhere. Let's just camp out. But the Lord was like, no, we got to get out into the streets. We've got work to do down there. So as much as we want to stay in these safe spaces and places of glory, we too are called to go out into the world. So heart check. 
Are you getting off the mount or are you staying within the safety of the holy huddle? And we end here, why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? So this chapter ends with Solomon looking upon his bride who is dancing. Now, I don't think that this is a private dance. I think that this is a public dance because we see here in chapter seven, how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of bath Rabim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. How beautiful and pleasant you are, loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. So as he is watching her dance this public dance, he obviously sees beyond what everybody else sees because he has seen her in privacy. And it's the same way that the way that Jesus sees us is so different than the world sees us. He sees us beyond just the outer beauty, beyond our successes, beyond any kind of front that we might put up. He sees everything to the deepest souls of our inner being. And guess what? What he sees is a beautiful thing, no matter how we see ourselves, no matter what we have done, past, present, or even in the future. And when he says her stature is like a palm tree, this speaks of her tall, noble strength and the ability to be able to bear fruit and also her strong character. Now, interestingly enough, the palm tree is the only tree that actually continues to bear fruit well into its old age. In fact, I think it bears more fruit the older that it gets. Verse nine, it goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding over lips and teeth. I think she's speaking of wine, but she is reciprocating and recognizing the goodness going on here. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. So she is not looking at his desire as a burden the way that she once was when she's like, I'm tired. I just took a shower. Verse 11, come my beloved, let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early early to the vineyard. So they're like, let's go on vacation now. Let's get away and see whether the vines have budded, whether the great blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. So she's initiating it here. The mandrakes give forth fragrance and beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, oh my beloved. Now these mandrakes are known as the love apple. This was an aphrodisiac that was used back in this day. So this tells me that that you have the permission to be creative within the confines of marriage in your intimacy. They use mandrakes. I don't know what other people are going to use. Please do not email me and ask me, is this okay that we are doing this in marriage? I am not your counselor. You got to find somebody else to ask those questions to. But that is how I interpret that, that we can be creative as long as you are thinking about intimacy as an act of worship to the Lord. Is this honoring to God? And now we are in chapter eight. This is kind of like Thanksgiving break. You know, now they're going to go home to their families. They have been married. They went on their honeymoon. They had their first fight. And now they got to go see their mother-in-law. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breasts. I know that sounds weird and freaky, but again, this is speaking of permanence. Like she just wants him to be with her all the time. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. So... Kissing family members, that kind of public display of affection was actually accepted. And so she's like, I would be this way with you. I would lead you and bring you out into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. So again, this would be that approval of the family members. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. 
So here, poetically, we see this punctuation or this exclamation of the joy of intimacy being spoken here. Verse five, who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So now that she's coming home, they're like, wait a minute, who's out there hand in hand? You know, it's almost like she's got her arm in arm with the king. And they're like, who's that coming up? Of course, a picture of us leaning on our Jesus. Under the apple tree, I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. Now, this seal speaks of ownership and their commitment. So she wants this to be a long time thing. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Now, this is a good kind of jealousy. This is the kind of jealousy that will protect a relationship, not the kind of jealousy that will try to control a relationship or control a person. So this is a passion, a good passion. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. So this is speaking of a persevering flame of love. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. So in other words, money cannot buy love. And this gives us this picture of the fact that our works cannot buy our salvation. We cannot do anything that is going to make God love us. He already loves us. And there's nothing that can separate us from that love. So there's no amount of tithes or offerings that you give. There's no amount of prayers that you can throw up. There's no amount of check marks of heart checks or even reading the Bible in an entire year that is going to win his love or or make him love you more. We do these things because we love him. This is out of our devotion for him, our love for him. This kind of takes the pressure off, you know, for us to just, just enjoy the love of God. Stop trying to work for it. So I'm not saying stop reading the word and stop doing your devotions and stop tithing and all that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just like, if you're seeing it as a means or a way to be able to earn his love, you got to change your perspective because that's not going to get it. You already have it. Verse eight, we have a little sister. So now we're looking back. This is a reflection of her brothers before the marriage. Okay. We have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall... We will build on her a battlement of silver, but if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. All right, this is speaking of purity now, and purity was a big deal in society back then because without it, the family wouldn't be able to sell off their daughter to a quality suitor. So her brothers here are vowing to build her up in her strength. If she shows self-discipline and the ability to be able to protect her purity, but if she is going to live loosely before she gets married, they're going to wall her in so that they can protect her and her purity themselves. So her freedom is in her hands. And in some societies, this is still emphasized, maybe even overemphasized, while the rest of us really overlook this. But it isn't overlooked by the Lord. Our purity is still so highly valued. It is still such a gift that He gives to us. And thankfully, by His blood, we are washed clean. So this isn't just speaking of sexual purity. This is a purity in the highest sense that we still have to work to protect. And whenever we do, this is the door to true freedom. Whereas if you live loosely and you live in sin, that's the thing that's going to keep you walled in. So heart check. Are you protecting your purity? Verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for it fruit, a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit, 200. So it's as if her man is her new vineyard that she has to keep. And so we're seeing this picture of this healthy marriage. And so he continues in verse 13, O you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. So he's now calling out for her, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So remember when she sent him away before, like a gazelle, now she's calling for him to return quickly. And this gives us this picture of us calling out to Jesus to return in haste, to come quickly for his second coming. So once again, this was this beautiful picture of 
intimacy of sex and the gift that it is to be within the confines of marriage. It is something to be seen as beautiful. It is an act of worship within marriage. And again, that is why Satan tries so hard to pollute it and to pollute it at an early age. I know the things that I saw as a young child and it polluted the way that I viewed sex. We have to work extra hard to be able to keep it holy, to keep it within marriage, to honor it, but then also to enjoy it for what it was intended to be. And the reason why there is such an emphasis on not partaking in premarital sex is because you know that there is a hormone, there is a release of chemicals within the body within this act. And so what happens is whenever it happens outside of marriage, you're going to continue to crave that high the same way you would with a drug, because that's what it ends up being like. Lust ends up being like a drug where you keep on craving it and coming back for more and more and more. And eventually what happens is there's this breakdown within your soul because when two come together, they are becoming one. And not to mention all of the other things that come with it. You know, you've got STDs out there. You've got unwanted pregnancies. You've got a whole slew of insecurities that come along with it. Potential jealousy later on. Baggage that you carry with you. And so I believe we are all offered a fresh start, a fresh perspective from this moment on, from reading this, to be able to understand how beautiful and sanctified this should be. And we got to look at it that way. And we've got to protect it. So taking a look at some of our deep dive questions, describe the character of the woman and the character of Solomon. How do these qualities cultivate a healthy marriage? How does the dynamic of their relationship go against or reflect the societal norm of marriages in this time? How can God's love for his people be seen through an allegorical approach to reading this book? How does my beloved is mine and I am his describe your relationship with Christ? What are we to him, and what is he to you? What role does the chorus of Daughters of Jerusalem play? How is love portrayed in this book, and how does it compare to the love that you know? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love that you so beautifully encapsulated through the love of Solomon and his bride. Through the deep layers of these passages, we are able to see the intricacies of love in its highest sense. Lord, I pray that we will continue to gain a good understanding of the different types of love and where they apply. Help us to protect it with everything in us, honoring you as we do. We know that love goes beyond just emotions or feelings or even the bedroom. And as we accept the daily invitation to be open and honest with you, help us to allow this vulnerability to keep us submitted in the best way. You are not this controlling God who wants to keep us holed up or walled in. You desire us to live freely, and the best way to do that is by recognizing that your protection of us is out of love. So we thank you for your agape love, a love that is without conditions and sees no limits. You look beyond our faults and see us as spotless and without blemish or wrinkle. So we thank you for loving us in our darkest hours and for speaking over us words of affirmation, joy, peace, and encouragement. Help us to hear those, especially when the enemy tries to say that we are unloved or tarnished, because that may be true. We know that he hates us, and we also know that our tarnished nature is being perfected every single day. So I'll agree there, but what I won't agree to is the allowance of his voice to deter me from running after you and seeking you all of my days. So we cast off anything that is causing us to forsake you, and we recognize our darkness, but also the grace that covers it. And we thank you, Jesus, for being our friend. We know that all relationships take work and that you stand at the door and knock. All we need to do is open it up. But then the real test is how much time we decide to sit and dine with you and really get to know you. I pray that we never see it as a burden, Lord. May we never think that this book is too long or that fellowship with others is a waste of time. How it must break your heart to hear people say that. Forgive us if we've ever felt that way. We also know that we have responsibilities and that we can't just stay on the mount and hide in the cleft. We are called to go out into the world, so help us to have the discernment and ability to prioritize well. And I pray that we will all protect our purity, whether married or not. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of eros and intimacy within our marriage. 
Help us to see it for the valuable gift that it is so that we can teach the younger generation to guard it with everything in them. And Lord, guard our hearts from anything that might taint our view of it. Keep us from watching things or from participating in conversations that will defile our thoughts. That's where it begins. It begins in our minds. So may we take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. And Lord, we pray for a special blessing over marriages today. I pray that we can all come back to the place that had us smitten in the first place. Help us to see our spouses for the gift that they are, and I pray they'll see us the same. Work on our hearts so that we can be the best partner and helpmate. And we know that you will do a work in our other half, so we lay that desire to control or change them before you. We place our marriages at your feet. We submit ourselves to you first because we are your servant. We commit our intentions, our faithfulness, and our trust to you, knowing that you are the wellspring of our marriage. So may we keep you at the center of it always. Give us a heart for our spouse, Lord. Help us to respect the purpose that you have for their lives as much as we do our own. We pray for healing and restoration upon those who may be struggling right now. Give us wisdom in how to deal with brokenness and hurt and betrayal. And may love cover all offenses. Lord, teach us to honor you in the way that we support and bless and encourage one another. I pray that our marriages will be a light in a dark and broken world, and may we bear fruit that continues to grow well into our golden years. And for those who may not be married yet, Lord, and still waiting for the one that you have for them, strengthen their faith and their patience today as they wait. You are the source of all good things and the giver of good things, so we know that you have the perfect one for them. Help them to trust in that and to continue to grow with you so that they will be unshakable in their identity when that wedding day comes. And for anyone who is healing from a broken marriage, will you restore them today? Breathe peace and wholeness upon their hearts. Help them to pick up the broken pieces and to walk uprightly once again. We know that you can give beauty for ashes and turn all things for good. So we trust that you will in these cases. And as we allow your love to wash over us, your living water to nourish us, and your spirit to breathe life into us, may you be blessed, for we desire to honor you with every part of our being. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.